the month of April is Minority Health Month. And yes, you guessed it, we are not well. I've got some explaining to do. Let's get into it. like that short intro. (laughs) Short and to the point. Hey there, Ollians. Welcome back for another episode of Ayana Explains It All, the podcast hosted by the Black Muslim lady lawyer, born and raised in the hood, with an opinion on everything, living in the suburbs of Northeast Ohio. What an exciting place and time it is. Apparently there's some kind of basketball thing going on. (laughs) I don't know. I avoid sports except for soccer. Ayana Explains It All is the podcast that is available on 13 media streaming platforms, including Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, to name a few. The podcast is also active on popular social media platforms, including Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Go to our new website, Ayana explains it all.com. That's A Y A N A explains it all.com. And you can find links to all of the social media sites. You can find episode updates. I'm even trying to do a blog, trying to do a blog. But also, you can find news and information about the podcast. You can leave reviews. You can rate it. You can subscribe. You can email me. You can send me questions. And you can also tip the host. Yes, this is no longer a hobby. No, this is a job. (laughs) Well, a fun job. It's a job that I love to do. I love, I have a voice and I love getting my voice out to a wider audience than just the little posts that I leave on Facebook and Twitter doing my raves and rants and whatnot. And um, I use a lot of news websites to do this podcast, to put each episode together. I also use a lot of personal stories, but a lot of these news websites are paid subscriber websites. And so all of that comes out of my pocket. All of the um, software that I use is yearly, pay yearly, pay monthly. And that also comes out of my pocket. It makes everything work very well here, but it's not cheap. It ain't. And I am a government lawyer. So anyone who's thinking, oh, she's rich because she's a lawyer. (laughs) No. So anyway, if you want to leave me a tip and that'll help keep this podcast running smoothly and help me do all the research that I need to do, you all can become patrons of the podcast and help me out. And if you can't, that's fine too. I just love that people listen. I love that you all are listening to the podcast and that you're hearing the stories that I'm sharing and the opinions that I'm sharing. And if you don't share them, that's fine. If you do, that's fine too. I'm here to bridge the gap between current events and human behavior, and I even inject some humor in, and a little bit of cussing. I do some cussing. So tell a friend, tell a neighbor, tell a doctor, tell a local grocery store cashier. Ayana explains it all is for everyone, except for the kids. Again, I cuss a little. Maybe you don't want your kids hearing that smut. (laughs) So let's get into this week's topic. April is National Minority Health Month. And I did an episode last year for Minority Health Month, and I went in-depth on the things that are killing Black people. And there are quite a few things, but some things that are preventable that we're not taking seriously. And it's funny because every time a Black celebrity passes away and we find out that the cause of death is cardiovascular disease or some kind of neurological disease, and it's something that is manageable, but people aren't managing. I have a friend, Frankie, who will text me and say, I remember that episode of your podcast. And now I see what you're talking about, about black people who are dying before the age of 60, even before the age of 50, from heart disease and stroke and diabetes. And people are not taking these things seriously. And yes, even wealthy people are dying from these manageable, sometimes preventable diseases and disorders. And Minority Health Month tends to focus on 
getting people treatment for their diseases and disorders, getting people to the doctor. It focuses less so on what I'm going to talk about today, and that is health equity. It's one thing to help people get to these tests, get to the doctor, get to see the specialists, get them to take their medicine, get them their medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Those everyday things. That's one thing. But it's another thing to understand why minorities in the United States are not receiving the health care medical treatment that we need to understanding the barriers to us receiving care and good care, good quality care. Practitioners and legislators and people studying minority health matters need to explore and ameliorate the issues that often prevent or are personal barriers to people seeking health treatment. During Minority Health Month, various events and activities is like this whole festive thing. And, you know, I've, I've said this before. I don't like performative shit. I don't like it because you know that it's hiding something. You know that there, there's a reason why they're throwing this party. There's a reason why there are balloons here. There's a reason why there's a health fair. It's not, it's, it's, to me, this issue is more complex than how it's being addressed. Minority health fairs, great. Get some people in, give them some free shit, maybe do some health screenings, great, fine. Okay, but when you leave, when you wrap that up, how are you still addressing the medical and healthcare needs of these communities? And don't say, oh, well, we give them rides to the doctor because that's not enough. Though there are social barriers, yes, but there are also economic, legislative, there are attitudes that are barriers to people seeking treatment. Overall, the goal of Minority Health Month is to promote health equity and to eliminate health disparities that exist between racial and ethnic minority groups and the majority population. Health equity is the idea that every person, regardless of their background or socioeconomic status, should have access to the same level of health and well-being. However, Health equity is not always achieved, and there are several factors that can impact a person's access to health care and overall health outcomes. Disparities are caused by a, a complex combination of social, economic, and environmental factors, including poverty, lack of access to health care, discrimination, and cultural differences. Minorities often face barriers to accessing health care, including language barriers, lack of health insurance, and limited availability of health care services in their communities. This can result in delayed diagnosis and treatment, leading to poorer health outcomes. There are several barriers that may prevent Black people from seeking medical treatment. These include historical trauma. The history of medical experimentation and mistreatment of Black people in the United States created a legacy of mistrust and fear of the medical system. This history can lead to reluctance to seek medical care and distrust of medical professionals. Think the Tuskegee experiment, the study conducted between 1932 and 1972, by the United States Public Health Service and the Center for Disease Control, the CDC. It's called the Tuskegee Experiment because it was conducted on the campus of the Tuskegee Institute in Macon County, Georgia. The intent of the study, the intent, was to record the natural history of syphilis in Black people. When the study was initiated, there were no proven treatments for the disease, but more than 100 people died as a result of the experiment. People who participated in the study did not know that they were in the study. They did not know that they weren't being treated. The study continued without funding. The study continued without informing people. And None of the infected men were treated with penicillin, despite the fact that by 1947, the antibiotic was widely available and had become the standard treatment for syphilis. That study became infamous. 
and is correlated with increases in medical mistrust and mortality among African-American men, not just African-American men, but black people, period, don't trust the government when it comes to jabs and sticks and treatments. And, and you'll hear this a lot. Yeah, you know, the government, they'll try to poison you. They'll try to poison you with that uh, medicine. I know we heard this all during the COVID-19 pandemic. The medical mistrust is it was high. It's still high. It's ridiculous. Even something as simple as penicillin is not trusted. So there are attitudes that need to change. But because of this historical trauma, attitudes are slow to change. But there's also a lack of access to health care. Black people are more likely to be uninsured or underinsured, which can make health care services unaffordable or inaccessible. This can be due to factors such as poverty, unemployment, and limited access to health care facilities. Racial bias and discrimination is another factor. Black people may face bias and discrimination from health care providers. I have talked about this in previous episodes of Ayana Explains It All, about how black women are treated by providers when we are carrying a fetus how our pain is ignored, our pain complaints are ignored. But this is true of so many situations with Black people. If you go into an ER and you're in any kind of physical pain, sometimes your pain complaints are dismissed altogether. And you're given Motrin or acetaminophen and you're sent home. And in some cases, people die at home because their pain complaints were ignored, dismissed, by medical practitioners as fake, feigning, drug-seeking, et cetera, et cetera. When that happens, that can lead to lower quality care or misdiagnosis. It can also lead to frustration, mistrust, and reluctance to seek medical care. Black people who do not speak English as their primary language may have difficulty communicating with healthcare providers, which also can lead to misunderstandings and a lack of trust in the medical system. Do you see a pattern here? All of these things lead to lack of trust in the medical system. So you would think that one of the ways the government, states, federal, would try to improve health equity is, to, is by helping to build trust of minority populations in the medical system. There is such a huge divide between what we trust and what we know and what we don't trust and what we don't know. And patient education is not going far enough to make people feel comfortable about seeing a doctor, making medical decisions, finalizing treatment, and in choosing a provider that they can stick with choosing a hospital that they can stick with, finding a neighborhood to live in that's close to a hospital, hospital or a provider that they can stick with for, them, for ourselves and our children. I keep saying they, but really it's for us too. I think because I live in the suburbs, I'm immune. <laughs> I am not, but there are also cultural differences. Black people may have different beliefs and values. I mean, fuck yeah, <laughs> related to health and illness which may not be fully understood or respected by healthcare providers. This can lead to a lack of cultural competence and a mismatch between the patient's needs and the care they receive. Overall, these barriers have serious implications for the health and well-being of Black people, and efforts are needed to address them and ensure that all individuals have access to high-quality health care. And this is the aim of the widely known, often referred to <laughs> health insurance program called Obamacare. It's known as the Affordable Care Act, but in popular culture, it's called Obamacare. But this is one of the aims, health equity, to ensure that all individuals have access to high quality health care. To address minority health disparities, however, there are three prongs to this that I see. There are the social determinants that can be barriers 
there are the legislative issues that can be barriers, that can be a hurt or a help. And then there are the attitudes. I've talked a little bit about that. Attitudes that need to change to ensure that all individuals have access to high quality health care. You can't just say, oh, well, the issue is that people don't have a ride to see their doctor, so we're going to give them a ride. And that means that they'll be able to get high quality health care and everything will be okay. And you can't just say, well, we're, we've expanded Medi Medicaid in all these states now. Everybody has access to health insurance, whether they work or not. And so that's going to solve all the problems. And you can't just say, well, more Americans think that health care should not be tied to employment and that's going to change everything. No, they have to work in sync. The social aspects, the legislative aspects, and the attitude have to work in sync to ensure that all individuals have access to high quality health care. And I don't believe that this Minority Health Month addresses that. It doesn't go far enough. There needs to be more than just patient education about, you know, how to do self breast exams or the importance of getting prostate exams or here. This is why you should take your granny to the doctor. I mean, it's it's simplistic, but this is a complex issue. You can't throw simple. You can't throw simple solutions at a complex issue. As with anything in the United States, attitudes, legislation and social barriers have to be broken. Attitudes have to change. Legislation has to be put in place and social barriers have to be torn down for there to be any evolution and change in this country. There are these minority health disparities that are social barriers, economic barriers, the differences in health outcomes and access to health care between minority populations and the majority population. These disparities are often based on factors such as race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, geography, and language barriers. Studies have consistently shown that minority populations experience higher rates of chronic diseases, such as diabetes, heart disease, and obesity, as well as higher rates of certain cancers and infectious diseases. Additionally, minorities often have lower rates of health insurance coverage it's important to address these underlying social determinants of health, such as poverty and discrimination, and to ensure that healthcare services are accessible and culturally appropriate for all individuals. And what do I mean by culturally appropriate? Well, in my culture, for instance, in Islam, women, generally speaking, do not want to be seen by a male practitioner. I understand that there are some cases where you cannot help it, you can't prevent it. But we don't want to be seen. We don't buy a male physician. We don't want to undress in front of male nurses and male physicians. We don't want male nurses and male physicians touching our body because of modesty rules. So to say, oh, well, you have quality health care. You have quality doctors in your area, and they're all male, and there are no female ones. There are no female gynecologists or primary care physicians. That's culturally insensitive. One thing that is sometimes overlooked is also efforts to improve diversity in the healthcare workforce and to increase cultural competency among healthcare providers so that, again, we can improve healthcare out outcomes for minority populations. We need to ensure that healthcare services are accessible and culturally appropriate for all individuals. Addressing minority health disparities requires a comprehensive approach that addresses the underlying factors that contribute to poor health outcomes among minority populations. But these factors can interact and compound each other, resulting in a greater burden of disease and worse health outcomes for minority populations. When we think of health, again, we often think about getting to see a doctor and taking our maintenance medications or getting tests, but we sometimes forget that there are other unhealthy behaviors and health targets and health issues facing minority populations. Reproductive health, personal safety, you know, sexual assaults, homicides, police brutality, domestic violence. These things need to be talked about in the conversation about health equity. 
because these are health issues that are sometimes not addressed at all, including mental health issues. You know, the buzzword now, the buzz phrase, buzzword phrase, or however you want to say it, is prioritizing your mental health, prioritizing your mental health. People don't, don't think about what that really means sometimes. It means getting the health treatment that you need so that you can manage your disease or disorder. It doesn't mean just taking a day off. No. It means finding the help that you need so that you can balance what's going on with your brain with the rest of your life, your work, your family, your hobbies, your friends. It's so that you can balance it. When you prioritize it, you deal with it, you get a handle on it, you build your strength and your resiliency so that you can balance it with the rest of everything. If you don't address it, there's no way you're prioritizing it. You have to address it. But mental health, reproductive health, personal safety are things that are often overlooked when we talk about minority health. And every month, it seems that the federal courts and the GOP uh, legislators and GOP-run states are restricting access to reproductive health care options, while also not expanding access to healthy options for reproduction. There are those in government who want to force us to have babies, but they don't want to ensure that we're safely delivering a fetus, that we're safely carrying a fetus, that our needs are addressed, that our maternal needs are addressed when we're pregnant and then postnatally. There should be follow-ups. If you're tied to your home, if you're not able to leave your home, there should be someone who can come and visit you, maybe a nurse practitioner, maybe a doula, someone who can come and visit you and give you the checkups that you need, that your baby needs. These are all things that are not being addressed when we talk about minority health month and minority health care. When we talk about good quality health care, it's comprehensive. I know in in, in circles where I frequent online, people are not talking about health. People will shout, oh, mental health matters, mental health matters. But then they're not talking about why it matters. They're not talking about how to get to the help you need. They're not sharing resources for good mental health practitioners or access to funds to pay for it. Sometimes you don't have the money for therapy or uh, medication. We're not getting people to the things that they need. We're telling them what they should get. But then when it comes to helping people get what they need, we're just kind of sitting back and going, oh, well, maybe they'll, they'll figure it out. They're adults. They'll figure it out. But again, one of the largest barriers to minorities receiving good quality health care in the United States is racial inequality. It is what keeps racial minorities from receiving the best and appropriate health treatment, including maintenance, medication, routine wellness exams, maternal well visits, pediatric well visits, life-saving medical exams, including prostate exams, mammograms, and pap tests, as well as STI tests and vaccinations. Here are some of the factors that can affect health equity. Number one, socioeconomic status. People with lower incomes or living in poverty often face greater barriers to accessing health care, including a lack of insurance, lack of transportation, and limited availability of health care services in their area. And therefore, lower income levels are often associated with poorer health outcomes. Minority groups are more likely to experience unemployment and underemployment, which can lead to a lack of access to health care and other resources that promote good health. Occupational hazards as well. People who work temporary jobs and jobs with no health benefits or safety measures in place are more likely to suffer on-the-job injuries requiring extensive medical treatment. Number two, race and ethnicity. Minority populations may experience disparities in health care due to discrimination, bias, and structural inequalities. Experiences of discrimination can lead to chronic stress, which can contribute to a variety of health problems. Minority groups are more likely to have lower household incomes than non-minority groups, 
which can lead to a lack of access to health care and other resources that promote good health. Also, minority groups may face language bar barriers that limit their ability to access health care services or other resources that promote good health. And when people assume they'll be treated differently by a medical professional because of their race or income, they will simply not seek treatment. And a lot of black people have the attitude that they are not going to be taken seriously by their doctor, that their needs are not going to be addressed, that the doctor isn't going to listen. But again, as I mentioned before with the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiment, people just have a general distrust of the medical field altogether. And they assume <laughs> that a trick is going to be played on them, that they're going to be experimented on, they're, that they're going to be used for some kind of nefarious purpose, so they're not going to bother seeing a doctor. People with lower education may have limited health literacy and struggle to navigate the healthcare system. Minority groups are more likely to have lower levels of education than non-minority groups, which can lead to lower paying jobs and less access to health care and, and other resources that promote good health. Number four, geographic location. There are so many of these factors, and I pared it down <laughs> as well as I could, because I know you all don't want to hear me drone on and on and on about inequities and inequities, and inequ but there are so many. For as far as we think we have come in this country, it's 2023, we had a black president, we've got a black vice president, we, you know, have black CEOs, we have black entrepreneurs, doctors and lawyers and TV hosts and judges. My goodness, why do we still have all of these health disparities? Why? Because people focus on the body and not the structure. We focus on the health of the body and not the health of the neighborhoods, not the health of the brain that has to get the human to see the doctor, not the health of the environment, not the attitudes or practices of the insurance companies, of the legislators, and again, until the ACA, not the legislation. And every year, every month, it seems that there is some legislator somewhere in the GOP, there's some state, there's some person fighting the ACA, trying to get it overturned, trying to get provisions excluded, trying to get the government to say, well, if you're a religious uh, employer, you don't have to cover this, and trying to get insurance companies to bow out of it, et cetera, et cetera. There are people constantly working to try to get out of this because. The American attitude is that healthcare should be tied to employment. When the rest of the world is saying, no, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to wait to see a doctor until you have a job. And certainly, you can go and see a doctor, you can pay privately, absolutely. But there are certain treatments that you have to prepay for. Surgery, you gotta prepay for that. If you wanna go see um, a doctor, a primary care physician, just for general complaints or you're, you want your baby to get a checkup, you have to pay the copay or the full price before they will see you if you don't have insurance. So attitudes about medical insurance and who is deserving of it and are all Americans equal when it comes to this kind of thing need to change. Instead of, instead of that, we focus just on the body, just on the body. And it's not enough. It's not enough. It's not going far enough. It's not doing enough. But geographic location also plays a role in this. People living in rural areas or remote locations may have limited access to healthcare services and face additional barriers to receiving care. Minority groups are more likely to live in neighborhoods with limited access to healthy food options, safe outdoor spaces, and quality health care facilities. And of course, environmental factors. Exposure to environmental hazards such as air pollution or toxic substances can have negative effects on health and disproportionately impact low-income communities and minority populations. 
if there's one thing you're going to do today, <laughs> it's you're going to learn something today. You're going to learn that you need to pay attention to the big picture. And what I mean by big picture is that when you step outside, you're going to look at everything around you, everything around you. This is what is affecting your ability to receive good quality health care, where you live, how you live, if you work or don't, if you have children or you don't, if you have income or if you're impoverished, if there are clinics or hospitals within a few miles of your home, the air you're breathing, the water you're using to cook with and clean with and drink. All of these things are affecting your health. All of these things are affecting your access to good quality health care. Number six, health behaviors. Lifestyle factors such as diet, exercise, and tobacco use can significantly impact a person's health outcomes and access to healthy food and safe places to exercise may not be equal across different communities. I live in Shaker Heights, Ohio. This is a walking city, but it's also a city. Um, it's a suburb of Cleveland. It's on a bus line. There's a reliable transit system, but there are also cars everywhere. So there's a lot of air pollution. There are cars, there are factories, there are buses. There are trains, there's diesel, there are all these. I mean, you saw the train derailment stories of, of Ohio. So you know that there is environment pollution abound, especially where I live, because there are so many factories and so many cars. Now, if you go out to the country, and I say country, by that I mean just like the far western parts or the far southern parts of Ohio, the air is and the skies are, are clearer because there are fewer people, fewer cars on the road, but there are still trains that run through that can derail and poison the water. But where you live, as I said before, where you live can make a difference in your health and whether you receive good quality health care. I live in a walkable city. You can walk anywhere and get to work. If you work around the, the city or if you work close to the city, Walk to the grocery store, walk to, the, to um, the hardware store, you walk to a pharmacy. It's easy to get around here. You can take a bicycle. It's just, you can walk to places to eat, restaurants, fast food places. It's easy to get around here. So you, you might tend to see less obesity in places where people are able to move around more. In places where there are things to do, places to go, people can get up and get out. But also people are out walking their dogs. It's very dog friendly. It's very family friendly. So you want to get out and you want to visit your neighbors. You want to, you know, walk your kids to school and pick them up from school. You're getting up and you're leaving the house because it's also it's safe. It's safe. People tend to not leave the house when they know when they walk outside. They might be assaulted. They might be shot at. There might be cars speeding through their neighborhoods. It might just be generally unsafe for them and for their children. When they leave work, they go straight into their house and they stay in the house. And on the weekends, they go to the grocery store, they run their errands and they go home and they stay in the house. So access to healthy food and safe places to exercise may not be equal across different communities is affecting health equity. Access to health care, finally. The lack of insurance, the high health care costs, and limited availability of health care services can create significant barriers to accessing health care, particularly for vulnerable populations, disabled people, unhoused individuals, low income people, those are vulnerable populations. But again, addressing these factors is essential to achieving health equity and ensuring that all individuals have access to the same level and well-being. Now, there are plenty of organizations, include in the federal government, has also studied health equity, and they are promoting health equity, especially in light of the Affordable Care Act, which was seen as advancing health equity 
for the first time since Medicaid and Medicare, but it goes farther than just expanding Medicaid and providing more people of lower incomes with health insurance. It's trying to equalize the health experience of all Americans. And is it doing a good job? I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about that. One thing I wanted to point out, and this information comes from the FermanCenter.org, and um, this article is titled Health in the Segregated City. This is from October 2017, and what they state in the article is that living in an economically disadvantaged, racially isolated neighborhood is predictive of a shorter life, particularly for Black residents. Racial isolation is associated with health risks for Black residents. I mentioned that. Including higher levels of overall mortality, premature mortality, infant mortality, along with a range of other poor health outcomes such as preterm birth and low weight, many social epidemiologists see residential segregation by race and class as a fundamental cause of health disparities because it shapes exposures to critically important health risks and protective factors. On average, on average, disproportionately minority and low-income neighborhoods provide lower quality educational and employment opportunities, expose residents to a disproportionate burden of unhealthy environmental risks, and discourage healthy behaviors by forcing residents to navigate degraded built environments, and targeted advertising campaigns that encourage consumption of health-damaging foods, alcohol, and other products. Yeah. The Black neighborhoods in America are... (laughs) It's an incredible dynamic. You see so many churches, but you also see so many corner stores and gas station stores and little convenience stores or or bodegas, as people call them. And they're alcohol-filled, cigarette-filled, tobacco-filled establishments. And there's promotion of smoking. There's promotion of consuming alcohol. There's promotion of partying while drinking and smoking. There is promotion of eating unhealthy foods. There are proliferation of fast food places in black neighborhoods. We know them all. We we have, uh, we just got a Charlie's, a Charlie's sub place uh, not far from where I live, but there's also Popeye's, McDonald's, Taco Bell, Burger King, Wendy's. There's a Chipotle. And if you drive a little bit further uh, north, There's Arby's, there's Panda Express, there are all these places you can go and get a quick bite to eat. But some people are relying on these things for every meal and they're over consuming food, which can lead to obesity, which can lead to heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, stroke, etc. So. But this is what we're seeing in minority neighborhoods. I can only speak for black neighborhoods, really, but in Hispanic neighborhoods, because Cleveland has that um, has Hispanic neighborhood pockets. It's the same thing. That from what I've seen, and it might be different in other cities, but in the city of Cleveland, it's the same. It's just Hispanic. It's the same poor food choices, promotion of alcohol and smoking. Um. Gross. I, I, I've talked about this in the past, but Cleveland is a food desert. So it's a food desert for Hispanic populations, Hispanic neighborhoods, and it's a food desert for black populations and black neighborhoods. We're dealing with the same issues. We do not have different issues from each other. The only people who have it a little bit better than us are middle income and higher income whites. Because this applies to lower income people too. Lower income people living in food deserts, living in places where the promotion of alcohol consumption and poor health choices abound. So it's 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 not just a racial problem in most in some aspects, it's not just a racial problem. It's also an issue of income. 
income affects your quality of health. Income affects your health outcomes. And that's what you get in a capitalist society. But, but, according to some people, if you want nationalized health care, it's a socialist society. It's a socialist country. So we're either capital, capitalist or we're socialist. <laughs> it depends on who you ask. But as far as I am concerned, America is a capitalist democracy. It doesn't even pretend to be socialist. It doesn't even pretend to be. Because again, attitudes are not evolved enough to think that the government should provide health care for all Americans. There are just enough people who believe it, but they're not practicing it. They're not promoting it. They're not pushing for it. It's, we're slow to change. We are very slow to change. And, but if we didn't notice these health disparities before the coronavirus pandemic, it certainly made the disparities glaringly apparent, especially in racially segregated cities. The Furman Center goes on to point out, and this article goes on to point out, that patient-level discrimination compounds disparities in healthcare between white and black patients. Both segregation and individual factors help explain why racial and ethnic minorities are more likely to experience difficulty accessing care and to receive lower quality care when they do use health, the healthcare system, even after accounting for access-related factors, including insurance status and income predominantly black racially isolated neighborhoods are more likely to be primary care shortage areas, also offering few ambulatory facilities, more limited access to physicians, and a lower supply of surgeons. On the previous episode of Ayana Explains It All, I spoke about my hometown of East Cleveland and how it used to have its own hospital before it was taken over by the Cleveland Clinic and shuttered. We had our own hospital, emergency room. There were doctors, there were surgeons, there were primary care doctors. It even had a nursing school component. And once that was shuttered, I believe they replaced it with some kind of um, outpatient clinic. There's also a free clinic down the street that's been there for decades, down the street, I say down the street like people know what I'm talking about. But on Euclid Avenue, going west into the city of Cleveland, there was a free clinic that's been there for decades. But there are few to no primary care physician offices in the city of East Cleveland. If you want medical care, you're driving deep into the suburbs to get it. Or you're driving or you're taking the bus to another city to receive health care. And there are many cities like this. There are many regions like this. There are some places in the United States where there isn't even a, a practicing gynecologist for women to visit for prenatal care, for uh, health care. For any reason, there is no gynecologist. And I mean, the reason for that are many, but one of the reasons is that they're essentially being run out of areas because they want to provide reproductive health options to women but they're barred from doing so because the GOP, the conservatives, the Republicans hate that women have choices. They want to control our choices. And that clamping down on our choice is keeping us from receiving appropriate and proper health care. There are no doctors available to give us that care. They can't give us that care. They can't explore all of these options with us. And if they try to, they're sued. There are lawsuits against doctors right now because they provided abortion medication, because they provided an abortion to a patient. Doesn't matter the age of the patient. There are lawsuits against doctors who provide women with birth control because there are hospitals <laughs> There are hospitals, hospital systems, doctors, even pharmacists that don't want to dispense birth control to women. And yes, a lot of these places are rural areas. 
some in the Midwest, some in the South, certainly. But in these racially segregated neighborhoods, it's difficult to find specialists. It's difficult to find primary care physicians, certainly, certainly not surgeons. The, the article goes on to say a segregated health care system combines with medical discrimination and radicalized socioeconomic disadvantage to create dramatically unequal experiences in care for black and white patients. Social epidemiologists like to say that housing policy is health policy, but to the extent that health helps sort families into neighborhoods, health care policy may also be housing policy. Mitigating the effects of segregation and working towards greater neighborhood integration should include efforts to provide equal quality affordable health care across racial ethnic groups and neighborhoods. And again, attitudes play a role in this because do enough people believe in health equity? Do enough people believe that everyone should receive the same level of affordable health care, quality affordable health care? Ask the average American, should uh, an immigrant who just arrived in the United States who's applying for, say, asylum, or who is undocumented, receive the same level of equal quality, affordable health care as a citizen of the United States, they will probably say no. And this is one of the issues affecting immigration policy, is that people are pushing the attitude that undocumented, and I put that in quotes, and immigrants are coming across the border to have their health needs addressed. Women are coming across the border to have their, quote, anchor babies to deliver in the United States. That people are coming here and they're becoming a burden on the health care system. When that couldn't be farther from the truth. There are Americans who are going into Mexico and South America and Central America to receive health care. There are, are Americans who are going into Canada to receive medications that they could not afford or even get a prescription for in the United States. So who's the immigrant? Who's the uh, uh, system taxing scourge on society? We're all doing this. We all go where the, where the options are better. We shouldn't accuse them when we're doing it. <laughs> I remember. Oh, gosh, I remember I had my son. He's now 18. He'll be 19 years old this year. I had just had him. I had um, recently graduated from law school. I was let go from a job, and I had a, a baby with me. He was, I think he was a newborn by this time. But I used to get frequent um, ear infections. I have horrible allergies. I have allergic asthma, blah, blah, blah. And I would get these ear infections all the time. And I would also get sinus infections. And he was a baby. I did not have health insurance for myself. But I had Medicaid for him, obviously, in the state of Ohio. You can receive Medicaid for uh, a child under 18 if you meet the income guidelines. And this was in 2003, 2004, 2004, 2004, 2005. And I didn't have money to see a doctor. I had nothing. I was living with my, my family, with my parents, and I, I had nothing. And I was in so much pain. Oh, my gosh. I was in so much pain. And I didn't have money to go see a doctor. I, didn't, I wasn't going to ask my parents to take this burden for me. And so I ordered medication from Canada. I ordered medication from Canada, antibiotics from Canada. And it's what I used and it worked. <laughs> but I was relieved that that was an option. I couldn't order from a United States pharmacy online and have it shipped to me. That was, an op was not an option available at the time. I'm, I don't know if it is now. I'm sure it is now. But at the time, I mean, Americans were getting all kinds of medicines from Canada and we still do. Although Canada sometimes wise wise is up and see what's they see what's going on and they they're like no we're not shipping to the US anymore um they've done that with a few medications now 
but that's how I dealt with my issue. I went somewhere else. I was an immigrant in Canada. No, I stayed in the U.S. and I just ordered it to my house. But this is what happens when you have limited to no income. Your options, your choices are few. And even if you have a lot of money, but you know that you can receive better treatment elsewhere, that's where you're going to go. People go to South America and Central America for uh, cosmetic procedures, for teeth procedures, you know, for uh, veneers, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, you do what you got to do. You do what's safest. You do what you got to do. But back in the United States, poor health and discriminatory housing policies keep people in low income and economically depressed neighborhoods and their health continues to decline. Whereas when people are moved into better housing and better neighborhoods with better environmental surroundings, such as clean water, cleaner air, access to better ventilation, high access to good health care, health improves and mortality rates decline. Think about it. You have a child with asthma. I had a child with asthma. My son, when he was a baby, he had baby asthma. He's grown out of it. He grew out of it and I grew into it. <laughs> But when someone has asthma, you want them to, li to live in the cleanest air environment possible. And where I live at, pollen count, I mean, the air quality is just fucking disgusting. Oh. I, I, I pray and dream of living in a place where my allergies will not be as affected as they are. But I don't think that place exists in the United States anymore. I feel like we've kind of when it comes to poor air quality, that we've at least equalized in that point. It's not good in the North. It's not good in the South. It's not good in the West. It's not good in the East. But when people have high access to good health care, health improves and mortality rates decline. This is one way to build the Black community through high access to good health care. It's not just that people will receive the treatment that they need. Certainly, that is important. But building and sustaining racial minority populations can be had through high access to good health care. So in this Minority Health Month, remember that it's not just about getting to the doctor. It's about access to good health care that will improve our health and cause mortality rates to decline. We know that in Black people, ages 35 and up, the number one cause is heart disease, cardiovascular disease. The number one cause of death in Black people 35, age 35 and up in the United States is cardiovascular disease. Now, there are several ways to manage this, but it cannot be diagnosed outside of some tests. Sometimes you need a full cardiac panel, but you need medical care. You need good specialists. You need to see a doctor. And when those test results come back and confirm whatever your doctor suspects, they're probably going to prescribe medication to you. And if you live in a city like East Cleveland, Ohio, there is one pharmacy, one pharmacy. And if you have transportation, you can certainly drive or take the bus to another pharmacy. But you're relying on those pharmacies being available and open so that you can receive those prescriptions. And then you have to take the medication, but you also have to pay for it. Some of these formularies, if they're not generic and you don't have insurance, you're paying $2,000, $3,000, and certainly you can't afford that. And if you have insurance, if it's a name brand medication, your copay can be anywhere from $200 to $900. And I, as I'm watching television all the time, I see these um, ads for new medications, new medication. 
Ask your doctor about Sky Rizzy. Ask your doctor about Trulicity, if Trulicity is right for you. But you know when you see these commercials, these new medications, there's no generic for it. It takes at least seven years out on the market for a drug to have a generic. So this medication is going to be expensive. So you ask, your, yeah, you go ahead and ask your doctor about it. <laughs> and when you see the price, forget that you ask your doctor about it. And there are a lot of insurance companies who don't want, they don't want you to have these more expensive medications because obviously it costs them money too. And these new medications may be better for you, but they're expensive. So, but that's what access to good health care means. It means medicine. It means doctors. It means good air, though. It means uh, good water, clean water. It means um, living in a city where you can, where you have healthy options for food. It means being able to go for a walk, go for a run. It means not running the risk of being hit by a car. It means, it means so many things. And we tend to focus on just the superficial aspect of this is make sure your Nana gets to the doctor. Make sure you give your Nana a ride to the hospital. Make sure you get your kids to get their physicals, once yearly physicals. You know, that, that's at least one of the things that the ACA did that was so easy was that it made well visits. Um, if you have an insurance, well visits are cost free. But, but those well visits are usually where people discover that they have this thing or that thing that needs to be addressed. Usually the well visit is the first and only time some people see the doctor for that year for within those 12 months. And then they discovered that there's something wrong. So it's great that the well visit is free. The follow up should also be free. But hey, that's asking for too much. <laughs> Uh, back to, the, back to uh, what I was saying about social determinants. Insurers, medical practitioners, states, the federal government have long studied the social determinants of health equity, and they have also pushed for and enacted legislation and policies to address this. The U.S. and states can enact legislation aimed at reducing housing discrimination and employment discrimination. For instance, the EEOC, the Office of Housing and Urban Development, we have anti-discrimination policies. We have equal opportunity policies. But unless attitudes change and then practices change, the legislation is ineffective. The ACA, Obamacare, is one of the most comprehensive, equalizing, and life-saving pieces of healthcare legislation ever enacted in the United States. And while it has effectively reduced the high rate of uninsured racial minorities, it has not resulted in reducing health care disparities in treatment and access to medical care, in providers and their attitudes towards patients, and in insurance companies and their approach to reducing health inequities. For instance, and this information comes from the CommonwealthFund.org, they do a very good job of um, exploring health equity in the United States. And in this article called How Insurers can advance health equity under the Affordable Care Act, they explore how the ACA has these parameters in place to increase health equity, but that insurance companies are not utilizing them, that they're instead focusing solely on the social determinants that I explained or relying on philanthropy to help provide good health care options for Americans. Yeah, they're relying on people giving the money. They're relying on people, organizations, giving money to neighborhoods, to clinics, to hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, to provide good quality health care options when the ACA has these things in place and they're simply not using them. So the ACA requires marketplace plans. Now, this might get a little, but just bear with me. The ACA requires marketplace plans to have an adequate provider network and contract with essential community providers. Consistent with these requirements, insurers can develop provider networks that better reflect the needs of enrollees of color as well as other unders underserved communities such as the LGBTQ 
IA and people with disabilities who often lack access to culturally competent providers and face bias and discrimination in healthcare settings. And that was the other thing I just thought about when I was talking about vulnerable populations. Transgender people, that is a vulnerable population. I don't know why that didn't pop into my head. Um, I apologize if I, uh, if I excluded you guys. It wasn't on purpose. But yeah, these people often lack access to culturally competent providers and face bias and discrimination in healthcare settings. And the article goes into an example of maternal health disparities for Black and Indigenous people. Insurers can better ensure culturally competent and thus safer care by including a broader range of providers and perinatal workers, such as midwives and doulas, in plan networks. But many insurers do not, even though the services provided by these workers are linked to better outcomes and the ACA requires plans to have an adequate provider network. In addition, insurers can help ensure that all providers in their networks are trained to serve diverse enrollees and can deliver care to those with limited English proficiency. Without these actions, the article states, regulators should consider whether plan networks are truly adequate under the ACA. Consider, and they use the example of HIV and the PrEP medication, consider the coverage of pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, a medication that prevents the transmission of HIV in high-risk populations. Uh, for example, gay and bisexual men of color. Insurers were required to cover PrEP without cost sharing beginning in 2021, but not all extended cost sharing protections to the ancillary services needed for a PrEP regimen, like regular labs and provider visits. People who use PrEP had to pay out of pocket for these services. These higher costs led in turn, you guessed it, to lower utilization of PrEP. By extending cost sharing protections to ancillary services, insurers could have eliminated the cost barrier and made it easy to access this life-saving care. Instead, federal officials had to step in to clarify, which they do quite often. It's incredible that they have to do this because insurers are constantly thinking about what's going to cost them less and make them more money. What's going to cost them less and make them more money? So the federal government stepped in to clarify that insurers must cover these services and office visits without cost sharing. Insurers could similarly broaden cost sharing protections to increase access to other preventive services where disparities in financial barriers continue to exist, such as colorectal cancer screenings. In a second article published by the CommonwealthFund.org, they talk about strengthening marketplace network rules for essential community providers as a matter of health equity. They explain how the Biden administration has proposed marketplace plan rules for the 2024 plan year, and provider networks are a core feature of equitable health care. Provider networks that are too limited leave members without access to coverage. Now, providing coverage, getting coverage to everyone has been one of the main problems of the ACA. There are people who still fall into that gap where they make too much money to be part of the expanded Medicaid, but they also don't make enough money to purchase one of the plans under the ACA. And so they end up with no insurance coverage. There are still millions of people who fall into that gap. And there are still 10 states, in fact, that have not expanded Medicaid. Most of those states are in the South. And so imagine there are still thousands and thousands, millions of Americans who still live without health insurance, despite, despite there being this major piece of legislation and these, I will say, uh, almost changing attitudes about health insurance coverage in the United States. There are more people now who believe everyone deserve it, but insurance companies, as I just explained to you, are not buying into this. They are not 
doing what the government told, told them they had to do. They are not utilizing all of the services available to them to ensure that everyone has good quality health care. In fact, they are leaving some things on the table and just going with those basic superficial, we're just going to, you know, we're going to focus on the philanthropy and the social determinants and we're going to leave this legislation shit alone. It's ridiculous. It's, you cannot have this and this and this without this, legislation, this legislative piece. Unfortunately, that's how it works in the United States. Everything is legislated. Everything. Even a woman's body. So the Commonwealth Fund has also studied how the Affordable Care Act has narrowed, has narrowed racial and ethnic disparities in access to health care. The ACA's coverage expansions have led to historic reductions in racial disparities in access to health care since 2013, but progress has stalled and in some cases eroded since 2016. The gap between black and white adult uninsured rates dropped by 4.1 percentage points, while the difference between Hispanic and white uninsured rates fell 9.4 points. Disparities narrowed in states that has expanded Medicaid eligibility and in those that did not. In expansion states, all three groups had better overall access to health care than they did in non-expansion states, and there were generally smaller differences between whites and two minority groups, Black and Hispanic. In the years after the ACA's implementation, Black adults living in states that expanded Medicaid report coverage rates and access to care measures as good as or better than what white adults in non-expansion states report. Incredible. Incredible. That is, that's a huge accomplishment. While Black working age adults have benefited significantly from Medicaid expansion, unfortunately, they disproportionately, 46%, reside in the, at the time it was 15 states that hadn't yet expanded their programs. Now it's 10 states. There are more Blacks living in the states that haven't expanded their programs than there are living in the states that have. So there are still millions of Blacks living without good quality health care simply because their states refuse to expand Medicaid. They refuse it. This is the help that the uh, federal government is giving them, telling them to cover more low-income people, more people without in, any income at all. And they're saying no. No, no, no. You know why? I'm sure you can guess why. Why the ACA is hated. Why, did, why expansion of Medicaid is hated, even though it's clearly needed. Because it's the government helping people. And that's not what we do in the United States, is it? It's not what we push for. It's not what we look for. We think everyone should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Keep from uh, drowning in the mud. All you got to do is pull yourself up. Put your little finger in that little loop. Pull yourself up. Never mind you have um, heart disease. Never mind you weigh 500 pounds. Never mind you have diabetes. Never mind uh, you may be missing some extremities. Never mind. Come on. That's too bad. If I could do it, you can do it. If I can do it, anybody can do it. That kind of attitude is what needs to change. When I talk about attitudes, the attitudes of insurance companies and that pull yourself up by the bootstrap bullshit is what needs to change. It needs to die. And some of the changes that the Commonwealth Fund have suggested that state and federal policymakers can take is to, of course, expand Medicaid. A lot of them have already done it. There are 10 states remaining but also make marketplace subsidies available to people with incomes under 100% of the poverty level or otherwise fill the Medicaid coverage gap. Remove the income cap on marketplace subsidy eligibility. Enact targeted state-specific Medicaid expansions beyond the ACA. And allow undocumented immigrants to shop for coverage in the marketplace. Oh, imagine allowing an, Im an immigrant allowing an immigrant to benefit from something in the United States? Shh, don't tell them that. The Constitution of the United States applies to immigrants, too. Don't tell them that. Don't, t don't, don't, don't. <laughs> but in the years since the law's passage, notable, notable gaps between people of color and whites remain across all regions 
in all income levels. Progress has also stalled for Hispanics, Blacks, and Whites since 2016, and insurance coverage has slightly eroded for both Black and White adults. That can be linked in part to congressional inaction. As I said before, there are people in the federal government who don't like this legislation, who don't believe that the states and federal government should be providing health insurance to anyone, that it should be privatized and remain privatized. And so there's going to be periods of inaction, depending on who is in power. And they're going to be, uh, and there's going to be periods of strong challenges, depending on who is in power. All the policies, all the policies presented here can help make the U.S. healthcare system more equitable, but they will need to be accompanied by efforts to address drivers of racial inequities in health that extend beyond access to health insurance. Those include inequities in educational opportunity and income, as the Commonwealth Fund goes on to say, and the fact that people of color are often perceived and treated differently by healthcare providers. And this is what I have pressed in this episode of Ayana Explains It All, is that minority health is not a one month a year or one pronged solvable problem. You're not going to take the month of April and think that you're going to help people understand the health inequities present that keep minority populations from receiving good quality health care. It's not just that we're not going to the doctor. It's that we can't find a doctor. It's that we don't see the importance. It's that we don't understand why. It's that we don't understand the, the role the environment plays and the role that our housing plays and the roles of where we live plays in this. It's, it's that people are not open to the idea that everyone should have good quality health care. The attitudes are slowly changing, but as you can see, with insurance companies, it's not changing fast enough. There are these parameters in place that they are not implementing. The change is not happening fast enough to bring, to close the gap between blacks and whites and Hispanics and whites in health equity in the United States of America. Minority health equity is a multifaceted issue and focusing solely on housing is not enough. Focusing on legislation and health is not enough. It's important to address all of these factors and implement attitude changes and a change in business practices by insurers to promote health equity and ensure that everyone has the opportunity to achieve good health during the month of April, during the month of January, February, March, May, June, July, all the way through December. And this has been Ayana Explains It All, brought to you by Facts, Figures, and Enlightenment. Take care.